Well, we've heard uh, a little bit about uh, being and uh, feeling frustrated and unprepared or not qualified to do something earlier this morning and being a little fear of working. We've heard a little bit about credentialing, that sort of stuff, and how to negotiate for a job. And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about career uh, strategies and tactics. Now, in full disclosure, I must uh, say that I know and realize that all of you are from different backgrounds, different levels of wherever your professional career happens to be. We have some medical students. We have some people who, like myself, are fighting retirement, that sort of thing. So we're all over the board here. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to put yourself just at the first part of this in the role of an MBA student going to a school, and you're, you're not a doc anymore, you're an MBA student, because I'm going to talk about skills to start out with. Then we can shift it back over to where, wherever you are now, and we can put that into perspective. Uh, a little bit of background. The way, reason I'm asking you to do about the MBA students is I used to give all the talks for about seven or eight years in a row to the Harvards and Stanfords and Whartons and Michigans and Chicago and Northwestern about how to get ahead in the corporate world. And basically, it was how to, uh, how to build a career based on, it turns out you have to base it on skills. Uh, you, have to, you really have to be good at something. And you have to, and the question is, is what are those things? Uh, and so the first part we're going to talk about is, is the, uh, the career strategy. Now, you all have maybe, I'm sorry I don't have the screen and projector, because this, what I'm going to talk about is very graphic in terms of it. The graphics are really important. So, uh, I will try to talk through them if you don't have the, uh, the little handout. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, first of all, uh, the career, we're going to talk about career strategies and skill fields and that sort of stuff, but we're going to get into a, the, the tactics, a little thing called the doom loop. And that's going to apply to all of you, and I, I, I uh, will bet that every one of you will recognize that you're at least somewhere in there and you've been there or done things and you, it will, will relate to it. But we're going to talk about the doom loop. You'll find it's very easy to understand. You can generally explain it to somebody quickly on a cocktail napkin. That's the graphics up here are all built on cocktail napkins. It's tactical in nature. Uh, it has many application. And I'm going to teach you a new language. So by the time we're done here, you're going to have a new language and be able to talk doom loop language. Okay? I'm going to say, what does Q1 mean? And you'll know exactly what I mean, where in the past it might have taken you five minutes to explain it. I could just say you're Q3 and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's, there are remedies from, for Q3 depending on where you are in your career. But we're going to start out with some fundamentals about skills, okay? Now, since I don't have uh, the big field, the thing up here, I'm gonna, you're going to have to imagine that I'm going to describe what a skill field is. We're going to plot some skills on a field, you know, on a, on a piece of paper there, where there's a line at the bottom, you, for those of you who've got the graph, you can see it. There's a vertical line over at the left, and then there's a line at the top across. And across the bottom is where you start your career. That's career start. That's when you graduate from college or medical school or get your MBA or whatever it is, or a law degree. And going up on the left is time. Now, all the skills are going to be plotted in this skill field. The line across the top represents what's called a first career capstone position. Now in the corporate world, that is the kind of thing where, where you're first uh, responsible for something broad. I mean, you're the vice president of finance or the vice president of manufacturing or something like that, where you, it's the first time you've really had a, a level of responsibility. It could be in the medical world, I suppose you might be a, an attending uh, physician somewhere, or you're maybe the head of a medical practice or something like that. I don't know all the stuff in the physician world, but that's, uh, that might be what it, what it would be. And uh, if I'm in the executive search world and I'm going out and looking for people like that, say for example some company hires me to go out and look for a vice president of finance, what I would do is paint a picture of that person on that skill field. So there's a mosaic of skills. Now there's a, a graph in the lower left corner of the first page that kind of shows some dots that connect to the career capstone position at the top. And you can see it's a mosaic of skills. So I would paint a mosaic like that and then go out in the world and try to find somebody that looks like that. And when I find somebody like that, interview them, see how, you know, 
how they, you know, if they're ready to qualify to come in and see the client, and then uh, bring them in, they may get the job. On the other hand, if I'm looking for a vice president of marketing, the skill field is a little bit different. I was describing this thing about, well, before I get into that, when I was describing this thing to students at Stanford, for example, I was saying, if you want to get ahead in the corporate world, find the area you're looking, you're, you're interested in, and build a mosaic that looks like that, because that's where the headhunters are looking, and that's what companies are doing to make you successful. So look like that. And then uh, I was talking about dots, and some very bright young woman in the back raised her hand, and she said, Mr. Jett, she said, that's all very nice, but what do the dots mean? Can you put some words to the dots? You know, so basically what I did was, you know, got my hat out, my cane and my tap dancing shoes and tried to answer the question the best I could. I made it through. I don't remember what I told her, but I thought that's a very good question. And on the way back from Palo Alto to Chicago, I started thinking of all the different kind of career capstone jobs there are. First career capstones. There's a lot of them above that, like chief executive officer and stuff like that, but the first level capstone. And so I thought, I'm going to, I, I found about, I thought about 30 of them on the flight back to Chicago. And I had uh, resources in the executive search world so I could go in and find searches that companies had paid a lot of money for. For example, a search for a vice president of finance might cost $40,000. You know, and I had 30 of these capstones, so I got about 30 searches for each one of the capstones. So I had 900 searches of real data, not survey stuff. This isn't doing a bunch of survey stuff. This is hard data. So I thought I'd put together a nice little mosaic of each one of these kinds of things, throw it in a book, and sell it at the college bookstores. But then something really interesting happened. And if you look at the graphic on the second page at the top left, you can see there's an overlap between the vice president of finance and the vice president of marketing. As a matter of fact, there was an overlap between all of them. And a few skills were just kind of sticking out there, continuously being there, over and over and over again. And so what I thought is, hey, I found something pretty interesting. I found the kinds of things that you've got to have no matter what you do. And they, I call those critical skills. And there are, there are well, back, back when I did that originally, there were six of them. There's now eight, because one of them is split into two, and I added the other one because I know you have to have it. And so here are the eight critical skills you've got to have in order of priority for the whole research. Now, I recognize that they might be in different orders for different kinds of careers, but for the entire 900 searches, here are the eight critical skills. The number one skill was communications. It's the ability to get the ideas out of your head into somebody else's head, or out ideas out of their head into your head, whether you read, write, listen, or speak. And it, curiously, it's independent of the quality of what you're talking about. I mean, if you're an exceptionally good communicator and you're, you're, you're speaking total BS or a lie, you can be effective. Or if you're brilliant and have great ideas and can't get the ideas out of your head, you're ineffective. On the dark side, uh, Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf basically said, the bigger the lie, the more people are going to believe it. And Joseph Goebbels, his propaganda manager, said, you say this thing over and over and over and over and over again, people are going to believe it. And if you say there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq enough, <laughs> you, can, you can gin up a war, okay? Now that's what it's, what's happening. The second skill is a production skill, okay? It's how do you take something from an idea and make it reality, okay? You know, in the, you know it can be if you're a high schooler out in Rapid City where uh, Kelsey was in going to uh, college at the School of Mines. Uh, how do you, you know, whether you, at the high schools in Rapid City, they were having floats in the high school homecoming parade. Well, the kids would come up with an idea and then five days later they'd have a float. Well, you know, then Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. Well, to get him out of Kuwait was a little diff, you know, more complicated, but it's the same skill. You know, a woman needs a hysterectomy, all right? 
You can either take the scalpel and do all that kind of stuff and do the open hysterectomy and that sort of thing, or you can talk to Dr. Nancy here, and I hear about it all the time, is uh, you use a robotic. Uh, you use the robotic surgery and the woman goes in and has a hysterectomy in the morning and is home in the afternoon with virtually no blood loss. Now that's getting, that's a good idea and it's happening. Now the third skill and the fourth skill used to be one skill before the internet and that's called analysis but now it's broken up into two skills and the first one is information. The information skill is the ability to sort and uh, prioritize and test for truth the information you need to solve a problem. Okay, it used to be, how do I get that information? Now, with the internet and Google, it's, I've got a flood of information, how do I tell what's, what's relevant? Now, the key thing about the information is you've got to not only figure out what uh, information is relevant, because you've got to test it for truth. Now, as a physician, that's important. When you take a test, you don't just, you don't go in and just eyeball uh, an, uh, you know, a, a diagnosis, you take some tests. You've got to know what tests and what things to run to make a particular diagnosis. You don't run every test in the world. You, you gather the tests that you need to do a diagnosis, but you don't have perfect information, but you've got enough. And, but you don't just guess at it. Because the next skill is the analysis skill. This is taking relevant information that's uh, been tested for truth, and from that information, you derive findings. What does the information mean? Your conclusions. What do I conclude from those, that, that, those findings? And recommendations. It's precisely what you do as a physician in making a diagnosis. I, got, I have the information. I find out what that information means. I draw some conclusions, and I know whether to cut off the toe or the finger, you know, whatever, whatever the, the thing might be. But now it's an important thing with analysis that you remember the old P implies Q. How many of you remember that from school? P implies Q? This is logic. This is basic logic. P implies Q. P is your hypothesis. If something is true, then I can conclude that something will be true. So if P is true, you can bet that Q is probably going to be true if you can think properly. Then, but if P is not true, if your hypothesis is not true, then your conclusion can be either true or not true. It can be either. It can be whatever you want. For example, well, I don't want to get, draw myself into religion too much, but if you base your hypothesis on faith, whether it's true or not, you can draw conclusions that are either true or untrue. We got all sorts of religions all over the world, all sorts of denominations and that sort of thing. But if you have a, a hypothesis that's not true, your conclusion can be either true or not true. If you have faulty test data, what it, you can either come up with the right diagnosis or miss it a mile, you know? Uh, now the, the next one is a, let's see, analysis. The next one is an interpersonal skill. Now this isn't the kind of skill that, you know, I get along with people real well, you know? It's not that thing at all. It's you're a member of a team, and at the end of the day, people believe that you've contributed to the team. You've added value to the team. That's the interpersonal skill that's important. It's not, well, everybody likes you. So that's, that's the interpersonal skill. The next one's a technology skill, and that's, that's not uh, how do you design the robotic machine. It's how do you select the right technology to solve a problem. If you're going to write a book, do you use Microsoft Excel? Maybe dumb. You could do it and put in a word in each little thing. Or you know, if you're going to ana analyze a spreadsheet, are you going to use Microsoft Word? Or if you're going to, uh, you, well, I won't get into hysterectomies anymore. I've done that enough. <laughs> but anyway, and the next one is uh, time management. OK, now you'll, re you'll relate to this. Time management is you go to work in the day, you have 10 things to do, four are critical, you got to figure out what four of those four are, and then you got to fake it on the rest. Not fake it, you got to do as best you can on the rest. That's basically what it's all about, okay? Now those are the critical skills that actually came out through the research and I've thrown in the, in the next one called uh, uh, continuous education. You know, basically throughout your career, like it or not, 
you're going to wind up being in a position where you're going to have to reinvent yourself every three or four years. You know, suppose you're really good as a laparoscopic surgeon and along, along comes da Vinci. You're going to have to do, you know, do something. You're going to have to learn how to do that. So those are the eight critical skills. Now here's a couple of points about them. You can't get to the first capstone position without having these skills. Okay, number one. Number two, if you've got kids, are they learning these things in school? You know, where did you learn them? You know, you think about it, where do you learn the communication skill? Well, they have speech classes and English classes, that's pretty good. But where do you learn the production skill? Where do you learn the teamwork skill? Where do you learn the analysis skill? To learn how to think. You know, the state of Texas. Anybody here from Texas? Okay, well, the uh, Texas GOP has come out strong against critical thinking. All right? Yeah. Now, I'm not sure what they're going to substitute for that, but, you know, that's uh, one of the things to pander to those who don't want, you know, I don't know who they're pandering to that. But, uh, you know, how do you learn the technology skill? How do you learn the uh, interpersonal skill? Team sports, drama, music, that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you go to college, where do you, do you hear this in a lecture? Do you learn these things by sitting in a lecture, keep your mouth shut and taking notes? No. All right, let me ask you another question. How do you assess those skills? You take the, you know, when you think about the fact that we had no child left behind as legislation, and they're going to measure the school's performance on the results of standardized tests. Now you tell me what standardized test is going to measure any of those skills except perhaps reading comprehension. You know? It just doesn't do it. So then you have, if your performance and your salaries are based on the results of those tests, you're going to have people going to jail like they did in Atlanta. I mean, they're going to, fudge, they're going to teach the kids how to take tests. And how many people, how many people have, who here have hired people have actually asked what their SAT scores were? You know, it doesn't mean anything. So basically, there's a big problem right now, and we won't go into it, but then you hear things about the Common Core. The Common Core is a state-initiated state uh, program, basically, to teach, add a little dimension to English and mathematics. That's just, it's it. It wasn't started by the feds. It was started by the states. And the college board uh, group in, in uh, Princeton is working like mad to try to figure out how to help assess those things, and states are opting out of the assessments of the Common Core by the dozen, and you've got people like Bobby Jindle in uh, Louisiana who is really for the Common Core until he wants to get to his base, and now he's against it because he can get their votes. I, I don't know how it is, but anyway, those are the critical skills. Now, uh, all right, end of strategy. My, my points to you about strategy is if you if you want to get ahead in a career, learn, this, learn the critical skills. If you have kids who are in high school and want to go to college, here's my advice, and I've given a few uh, commencement talks to high school kids. Here's my advice to do, to do that. Find the school that you really like, because you're probably going to do better than that school. It doesn't make any difference if the school is ranked number one in the country or number 400. It doesn't make any difference. But if you really like it, you're going to do well there. Go to that school and major in what, something that you really love. Because you're going to be, do better at that. And concentrate on learning the critical skills. All right? Then, uh, if you're, okay, I'm going to switch over now to career tactics, okay? Oh, by the way, if you're in a career right now and for some reason you find yourself deficient in some of the different skills. There are all sorts of training programs out there. There's Toastmasters, all this kind of stuff, and then you'll see run into some things called, there's one of them that I get a kick out, it's called emotional intelligence now. That's an interpersonal skill, you know, that's, but, but there's people that actually make a living uh, teaching, holding seminars and charging a lot of money for that kind of thing. You know, if you believe it, that's okay. If it helps, that's okay. But, um, you know, it's all basically the interpersonal skill and how you apply it. Now we're going to get tactics, okay? So now you've decided to go to college, you've got all that kind of stuff, and now you're docs back. You're, you're out of the MBA program, and now you're, you're back in the world of docs. There are, imagine now if we're going we're to start doing a little mathematics. How many people are really good in uh, math? 
Okay, well, we're going to do some part, what are called partial differential equations, but we're not, you're not going to see us doing it. Here's, here's the theory. Just like an, I can define an individual to 1 in 400 quadrillion by the DNA profile, I could write a, an equation of an individual in the soft skills and other attributes and that sort of stuff. You know, the equation would be very long. You know, it'd be what kind of flavor of ice cream do you like, and that kind of stuff. And two of those variables in the big long equation would be, are you really good at what you're doing or not good at what you're doing, given what you're doing? And do you like what you're doing or do you not like what you're doing, given what you're doing? So I can legitimately, as a, an engineer or a physicist or whatever, analyze that equation of you against those variables over time, holding everything else constant. Of course the analysis isn't any good if some of the other variables change, but for the purpose of the analysis, we're going to hold them constant. For example, throughout the, the, uh, the tenure of your job, you still like vanilla ice cream. Okay, that variable doesn't change. We're going to hold everything else changed like that too. So now, imagine a, uh, a square. Okay, and we're going to we're going to cut that square into four parts. But before we do that, we're going to take a look at the job you have right now. So I picture the job and you ha you have right now, and I can tell you with a certainty, I could write a position description that fits your job to a T. Exactly what you what you do on your job, I could do that. I used to do it all the time. Then. We're going to take a little test on each one of the things that you're doing. And we're going to assume that this job that you have doesn't change for a while. We're going to measure those things that you're doing against whether you like them or you don't like them. Now, if you'll recall in your career, when you first take a job in an area that, uh, uh, you know, somewhere, you're, you, you generally like most of the stuff or you wouldn't be pursuing that career. So in this particular case, you're going to like probably a lot of the stuff and not like maybe a little bit of it. The other way we're going to measure it is, are you good at it or not good at it? Now, you're going to be some things you're good at, some things you're not good at. Now, when you first take a job, there's going to be some things you're good at and maybe some things that you're not good at. Now, not good at does not mean a negative thing. Not, mean, not good at means you just haven't learned it yet. Now, this whole thing it assumes you have the capacity to learn, okay? And, uh, it, it, and this, it also, this applies far more to smart people than it does to not so smart people, which is one of the reasons you find the C students generally running corporations, okay, later on. <laughs> Go figure. And you know, anyway, so you plot these things on a two by two graph. Have you got it? And you see that two by two graph on the, on the lower right? All right? I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute. Where on the left, okay, you got a, you got a square up here, okay? And that's cut into four parts. On the left hand side, you have like, and don't, and don't uh, no, good at and not good at on the left, and at the top, like and don't like, all right? So you got four quadrants. Now here is the first language lesson. The quadrant in the lower left is called Q1. The quadrant in the upper left is Q2. Quadrant in the upper right is Q3, and the quadrant in the lower right is Q4. Now if you're in Q1, where you are not good at something, but you like it, you're going to feel anxious, challenged, a little bit uptight, motivated, you know, you're really going to get going. If, you're like some, if you like something and you're good at it, you're going to be generally happy and satisfied. If you, don't, if you like something and you're not good at it, no, I mean, if, you, if you're good at something and you don't like it, you're going to be a little frustrated and bored. That's Q3, upper right. And in the lower right, if you don't like something, and you're not good at it, you're going to be miserable. So imagine now, we're looking at your job, the first time you're taking a, a brand new job, and you're good at some things, not good at some things, but you generally like everything. Your cluster that you plot is going to be somewhere between Q1 and Q2, you know, over on the left. You're going to be happy and satisfied about some of the things, and you know, you'll be a little challenged on the other thing. It's a good feeling, all right? Now we're going to hold everything constant, and we're going to look at what happens over time as you learn what's going on. As you're in that job for a while and you start learning things, you're going to start feeling better about it, actually. You're going to, your cluster is going to start moving up. All right? 
If you're in this job for a little longer, you'll learn more things as continue to move up. Until you reach that point, if you're in that job for a long period of time, it's going to level off at the top. And then if you're in that job for a long period of time, it's going to start coming down. Now there's uh, some medical journals that actually show that people who have really a lot of experience in certain medical fields tend to be biased in their diagnosis and jump to conclusions and that sort of stuff when they get Q3. All right, and I, I know that because I read the journals about this. So that curve for one job over a period of time is called a doom loop. All right? Now, I'll get, I, will, I will share with you, it's not a loop, all right? It's, you know, and it's not nothing doom about it, but it's a nice name, okay? And it's easy to remember. So it's a doom loop, okay? Now, the, now, now, we're gonna, now we got th four different things we're thinking about you know, in the language. You know what a doom loop is. You know what Q1 is, Q2, Q3, Q4. So if I say you're Q3, you know, you're, you want to do something about that. Now, when you're at the top of a loop, when, when the, when the, for math, math uh, experts, when the slope of the curve is zero, when you're at the top, you're doomed. All right? All right, now we're going to go into seven career crises, okay? And I imagine all of you could relate to some of these things once in a while. The first one is the first job. First job you've ever taken when you graduate from college. All right, first job has and doesn't have anything to do with the doom loop. First job, you know, the criteria often are, uh, I want to work outside the home, I want to have a car, you know, I want to have my own place, blah, 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 and so they, you know, you go to work and you're, you're happy. Uh, that seems to work, but that, you know, the, the, my, my advice for somebody in the first job is uh, you take that first job based on uh, trying to find some place that really does something right. You know, you work, it doesn't make any difference what you do, but you go to an organization that really does something right, and then you do whatever they tell you to do, and you concentrate on learning the critical skills. Because you're going to run into the second crisis, by the way, to support that argument. Uh, in the headhunting world, if we used to look for chief financial officers for corporations, you'd always want to get somebody from General Electric twice removed. Okay? You wouldn't want to take them right out of GE. You find somebody who'd been at General Electric because they're the best in the world when it comes to control systems and stuff like that, so they really learn how to do it right. And then they leave and they go to some other organization and they try to apply the General Electric stuff to there and find out that doesn't work, you know, and then they find a ha you kind of wander around and figure out how to do it right. Then you get them after that, where they're, you know, they really know the right way to do it and they're a little touch of reality, and so they can apply it where it works every time, by the way. If you're ever doing a search for a chief financial officer, just look GE twice removed. Anyway, you're in that first job for a period of time, and then uh, you come to the next crisis called first job disappointment. This is when you know, your mother and father are engineers, or something like that. And so you go to XYZ engineering school and get your degree in electrical engineering, and you wind up going to work for Hewlett Packard designing cir circuits. I hate this stuff, that's what you figure out. You find out you don't like it. So the solution to that second career crisis, called first job disappointment, is radically retooling, okay? If you go to the major business schools, Harvard's and Stanford's and so forth, and take a look at the backgrounds of these people, that's who's there. They're radically retooling. They're, they're getting an MBA degree, or you know, there's people that are in there that are lawyers and physicians and everything else, and now they're getting an MBA degree, something like that. They're radically retooling and positioning themselves for something else, okay? The third career uh, crisis, and probably the, the most dangerous one for somebody on the way up, is called, remember there's another word we learned, capstone, remember that word? That's that first level capstone in a, strat a strategy. It's called doomed, where you're up the top of a curve, before capstone. So you're, you're, uh, you're in a job and you haven't reached the capstone position, but then you go up over in the, into Q3. Everybody remember what Q3 is? Yep, upper right. So here's where the smart people really screw up. They're vulnerable to the headhunter, and you can spot these young people that are doomed before capstone a mile away. And you can basically offer them different kinds of jobs in different 
areas that might be the same, may, may be the same job, but in a different town. And so they'll make lateral moves, and then they'll, use, you know, they'll, use, they'll get paid more. You get offered more money. It's called the anesthetic value of compensation. All right? It'll make them happy for a while, and since they've moved from Schaumburg to Toledo, they're, I mean, I'm not sure you could be happy, nobody, not to offend anybody in Toledo, but, you know, <laughs> suppose you're happy in Toledo for four, it's a four-month period where, you know, you move and you're, you go back to Q2 and somewhere, and you, by the time you get to the top of the doom loop, if you made a lateral move, it's four months, four months. Okay, and then you find yourself doomed before capstone at a higher level of salary with a blurred mosaic. Remember when we were trying to build a career with, on a mosaic? Really, really a dangerous thing to do for these young people. And it happens to the smarter ones, the ones that go up the curve faster. You know, they'll, they'll make the dumber moves, all right? Now the third, uh, the next ca uh, crisis is called fired, all right? For, you know, or out of a job, out of work. Doesn't make any difference. Back a long time ago, the word fired used to have a negative con uh, connotation. Not anymore, you know. I, I was in the search world for a period of time. And, yes, ma'am. Oh, number three, okay. Number three, the solution, and I apologize, thank you for asking, okay? The solution for number three, uh, is, the best way is to be able to talk about it internally to somebody and add a dimension to the job you've already got. Uh, healthy companies understand that people get bored and frustrated in the job. As a matter of fact, Gallup uh, did a survey, you know, not, not too long ago, that shows that about 71% of the U.S. workforce is bored and frustrated in their job. It's Q3. And there's a direct correlation between productivity and boredom. Except in England, where they say, uh, you know, if somebody's bored, they're more creative. Uh, I don't know. But they're not productive. You know, they, they don't get the job done. They dream of something else. But the job is to try to talk to somebody in the organization first, and then... Uh, get an added dimension to your job, perhaps get, uh, switch jobs with somebody, stay within the mosaic. Uh, you gotta keep your fingers crossed that in an organization, it's okay to talk about being bored and frustrated in the job, because it's normal, all right? And, and if that doesn't work, then you just have to be very careful about finding something outside the company and not make a stupid lateral move. That's the answer. And fired, okay, that's, here's what happens when you're out of a job, okay? You don't have an income, your pressure's on, you don't like being, have people know you're out of work and that kind of stuff. And here's what happens to recruiters, both in companies and headhunters. If you're out of work, you're going to be scrutinized a lot harder than if you're happy in some job somewhere. You know, because, because uh, the company's going to want to make sure that you're really okay. And a recruiter is generally lazy, and it's harder to explain somebody who doesn't have a job and sell them, all right? Even the retained search firms. It's really hard. I've been there and done that. It's really hard to do. You, if you find somebody who's really good and not have a job for a legitimate reason, even so, it's very hard for, for them to do. There's also a problem for a person who's out of a job of taking a job which you call being overqualified for. That's don't take a job on top of a doom loop, under any circumstance. Well, maybe, you know, if they're really gonna pay you a lot for a short period of time. But, you know, the, th the thing is, is uh, you, uh, people are gonna want you to take that job, and you take a job on top of a doom loop, four months later, you're gonna be miserable, all right? So can then we go to the next crisis, it's called Happy below capstone, but doomed. This means there's, there's, you know, by far the majority of the American workforce aren't shooting for the CEO's job. They're, and they're not even shooting for cap, capstone job. This is steel workers here, et, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so they, they basically are below capstone and they go, they go doom loop. What you do is you enrich the jobs, make it a healthy organization to talk about uh, the fact you might be frustrated and bored in job and Add a little bit of dimension to people's jobs if you're an employer. If you're the individuals that's below capstone and you don't want to get to capstone, um, you, you might have to wind, if the company's not receptive to what you're saying, you might have to look, 
look somewhere else or change uh, what kind of business you're in or go to business for yourself. That's something like that. The next one is called doomed at capstone. This thing will never go away, you know, it just doesn't go away. Doomed at capstone. This is when you're at cap first capital capstone or above and you become doomed. I'll give you two examples. Nancy's um, director, medical practice head, is a marvelous person, fantastic, incredible. What covers her back beautifully is absolutely detailed oriented and that sort of stuff. And about three years ago, she was just bored and frustrated and ready to quit. And I sat down with her and we talked about the doom loop. She immediately put herself in lower Q3, bored and frustrated and not knowing what to do. So what the solution was, we couldn't give her any more responsibility. She was not a doc, and that sort of stuff. So what we did, we said, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep you at the same salary, but you can't work Tuesdays and Thursdays. You can only work Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So basically what we did, she, she was not good at doing her job in less amount of time. So that way we, we compressed the time on her. That, that, that works sometimes. For her, it was marvelous. She just blossomed. She just, she just took off and she did her job better than ever before. And on the two days that she wasn't there, she was a marathon runner. And, I mean, it just changed her life. The other job was a, a friend of mine who was the president of the Chicago Board of Trade, commodities stuff, wheat, soybeans, stuff like that. He'd go to work in the morning at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, and by 9 o'clock in the morning, he was done. And he would uh, uh, be bored and frustrated, and he used to talk to me. He says, what the heck do I do? What we did is the same thing, the time compression kinds of stuff. We uh, got him on the board of the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company, which was having problems up in Milwaukee, and we got him as uh, one of the uh, real active executive committee members of the board of trustees for the University of Notre Dame, which kept him really busy. And he wasn't really good at doing those extra outside things with that job, and that really turned him around as well. So the last crisis that you go into is called retirement. All right. Now, people like yourselves, and I think I can say that confidently, are busy people. You like doing what you're doing. You're, you, you keep working at that kind of stuff, and you're not good at doing nothing, and you don't like it. Q4 is the place you've got to avoid. I mean, it doesn't make any difference if you've got a lot of money. I mean, financial uh, planning and retirement happiness do not necessarily uh, come together. You're going to be happy in retirement if not only you've got financial security, but you're doing something you enjoy. You know, I can never retire because I'm horrible at doing nothing, and I hate it. Nancy's the same way. So we've got to do something. We'll open a goat farm or something like that. You know, do, do something we're not, we've got to go Q1 rather than Q4, you know. So those are the seven career crises. To sum up quickly here, uh, let's see if I left anything out. Pardon? What about number five? What's number five? Fired. I didn't fire, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Where were you? <laughs> you want... In denial. In denial. In denial. <laughs> well, anyway, to sum up, career strategies is skill building. If you're a parent, start getting your kids interested in critical skills. That's gold-plated stuff. Okay, if they get good at that stuff, of course they have to learn the fundamental laws of physics, math, science, that kind of stuff. But, they, but uh, you know, get them good at communicating. Quite frankly, I had a hard time of, uh, when people ask me what you learned at the Harvard Business School. Well, the answer is you really learn nothing, I guess. I mean, you, 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 you spend four, two years there in case studies, you never attend one, there's no lectures, zero lectures. You don't go to any lectures, you don't take notes. Imagine, imagine uh, three cases a day, they're all 40 pages long, and, you know, detailed stuff, some of it relevant, some of it not relevant. And then you go into a Socratic auditorium with 75 other people, all of whom are smarter than you are. People with, that might be Rhodes Scholars, lawyers, doctors, everything accountants and everything like that. All of them have five or six years experience in the business world or whatever. And your professor walks in in a marketing class and uh, you get the case for the day and comes in and says, 
Okay, Mr. Jet, why don't you start us out today? And you're on. And so you've got to have the communication skill. You got to have those production skills and make it, you know, get it. you have to have the analysis skill. You have to figure out what the stuff in the case is real and not real. You have to have the ability to uh, in analyze it and you have to have uh, all sorts of stuff and you practice those skills three times every day. And that's what they teach at the Harvard Business School. When people say what's the bottom line when you come out of there, you know, they say what you learned. And I said, I learned, I, I learned that I don't know anything. And the other thing I learned is I realized there's an awful lot of people out there that don't know they don't know anything. <laughs> and we know how to solve problems. I made a lot of contacts. Anyway, uh, that's the end of this, lo this show. Uh, what, uh, I do have a couple of blogs that you can go, if you, if you really like this stuff, you can go to them. One is called criticalskillsblog.com, and I throw stuff on there you know, about the Common Core and all that kind of stuff. One of them is called the doomloopblog.com, and I got a couple of books. One's called Wanted Eight Critical Skills You Need to Succeed. The other's called the Doom Loop. And you can get those on Amazon.com or Barnes and Noble and that sort of stuff in hardbound or paperback. I wish I had a lot of them to hand out to you, but uh, hey, what can you ask for? Is this, and anybody, have any, anybody have any questions about this stuff? Anybody really disagree with what I'm saying? Oh, I'll tell you a story about the Doom Loop. When I first started doing this, this is called being stupid, okay? I thought it was pretty clever to go and start giving presentations to, about this thing to the American Psychological Association. So I, I, I presented this for a couple years in a row to the National Convention of the American Psychological Association and thinking that somehow, and I was in the headhunting business, the word would get around and somebody would be selling me, sending me a lot of business. Wrong. I got a lot of resumes from psychologists that wanted to go to work for me. <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> Nothing on that kind of thing. So. Anybody have any questions on this? Was it helpful at all to you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to know if you have uh, thinking about developing some methodology to be able to measure each of these skills in the uh, How to measure the skills? Yeah, okay. Yeah. How do you assess? In a more objective way, yes. if it's possible. That's a very good question, and it's one of the things that we're we're doing right now. The way to the only way you can measure the uh, the critical skills is what through what is called authentic assessment. All right, for example, during the world, uh, the school to work years back in the 90s, I provided some uh, software management systems to schools that were doing work-based learning things. Internships. I mean, you can, you can kind of say that an internship is the same as an internship in medical, but here, in medical world, but here's how it worked. Businesses would have a partnership with the schools, and we'd, we'd draw up position descriptions, if you will, uh, of what the student was going to be doing. And not, not just uh, general kinds of things, but specific projects and tasks that the student was going to be doing. Then there was a rubric. If the student would do those things, and then the student was rated against that rubric on how they performed each one of those tasks. Now, each task was connected to a specific set of skills. Like, well, I didn't use the critical skills, I used a set called the scan skills at the time. And so, you could, since you had a connection between what students were doing in each task and the critical and the skills, you could righteously or you know correctly assess the student against the skills as well as the task performance. That's called authentic assessment. That's very difficult to do, but that's where you know a lot of people are coming back to that sort of thing. I have another book called Field Studies, and this is uh, intended to teach the critical skills, and it's based on work done with schools here in the Chicago area. i give you an example. We had a team of students, five females, uh, team members, and one female team captain, all girls, you know? And the idea was in the community of Wheaton, Illinois, which is a very conservative town for a liberal like me, uh, go going uh, out into the community and identifying community service organizations that wanted to participate with the schools. Once they did that, they went and interviewed each one of them, created the job descriptions for the schools, okay, or for, the, for that particular business, connected those, each task to the skills, and then set up and managed the in internship program itself, and the program lasted 20 years. This was done by a team of high school, five, uh, five juniors and one senior. And as a result of that, doing that field studies, 
One of them got a full ride scholarship to Northwestern, one got a full ride scholarship to Notre Dame. The one that got the full ride, oh, and then one went to Davidson. Uh, the one that went to Davidson, she was my team captain, her name was Rachel. She per had perfect scores in ACT and SATs. And uh, then she went to David's and then she went graduated from the law school, from Harvard Law. And now she is teaching this kind of stuff. So it's kind of a nice thing. Uh, the other example is we had a team, uh, and you can find out all about this. There's another blog called uh, Field Studies Blog and, and uh, high, school, high, school, high School Service Learning Blogs or something like that. You know, it's in, the, in the, one of those things where you, uh, we had a team of students, two kids from the inner city schools and two kids from the suburban schools work with the Wheaton Medical Clinic to evaluate the quality of medical services provided by the Wheaton Medical Clinic. All right, and so they, we, we identified patients. Now the criteria might have been a little skewed because we identified only those patients who had kids in the high school. So we wanted, we think worried about safety of the kids interviewing. We didn't want them to go out and meet Freddy Krueger, you know. So we, we, we'd have the kids interview these people about various services provided by the Wheaton Medical Clinic. This, this uh, program or that, that study was sponsored by the American Medical Association and the, some of the top people there. And then when they were done, they made their presentation to the Wheaton Medical Clinic and to the AMA. And uh, it was really amazing to see it. It taught all those critical skills. They had to communicate. They had to gather information. They had to get the job done. They had to manage their time. They had to write the reports. They had to do the analysis. And then, you know, get it done and do it. And they, it, it worked. Anyway. Yes, ma'am. Is there um, any research that you've done or anyone else about gender issues related to these different areas? Are there some that are, I don't know. You have a choice to do women or men get yeah. done quicker? No, or <laughs> even just which critical skills maybe we, there, is there any I don't have any, any information on whatsoever on I always thought women were smarter than men. <laughs> <laughs> and is there anything about the women getting doomed sooner? <laughs> What's that? And is there anything about women getting doomed at a different rate or a different way than... I could, um, no, that, that I could find. I didn't know when I did the research, when I've done research, I just know that there, it seems to me, and I can't prove it, but there's a direct correlation to getting doomed quicker if you're smarter. Because you learn faster. Oh, here's an important point. If you're a business owner, so some of you are maybe managers of business, medical practices and that kind of stuff, make it okay for people to come and talk to you about being doomed. Just think for a second, the impact on this country, if you could reduce the number of people who are frustrated and bored in their jobs from 70% to 65%. Think of the impact on productivity nationwide. And it all could be done at virtually no cost. All you have to do is enrich jobs a little bit. You don't have to, you know, do anything else. And it's easier to do that as a manager than it is to uh, prohibit conversations about being bored on the job and then you wind up losing the employer and incurring the cost of hiring and training somebody new. That's far worse than just getting smart. You gotta, I got a slide in there, it's tw second to the last, I think. Third from the last, fourth from the last. Of, of, uh, on the one hand, there's uh, the employer, on the right hand, the, the, uh, the uh, employee, and there's, they're shaking hands. You gotta be kind of career partners in this thing. Because, and the, uh, because on the doom loop, there's something pretty interesting about it. When you measure like and don't like, the individual is the one who can assess that properly. That was a, to your assessment qu uh, a question a little bit on critical skills, but who's going to assess whether you like and don't like it? The individual. Who's going to assess whether you're good at it and not good at it? The organization, probably. So if there's not a dialogue between the two, you don't have a healthy, healthy uh, environment. Any more questions? Yes, Sarah Lynn. You gotta go to her presentation tomorrow. There's the space lady. <laughs> and he's my PR agent, so uh, no commission there. Um, so Charlie, let's say you're in a very dysfunctional, let's say you're in a very dysfunctional environment and the individual who's your leader, your boss, 
is there not because of his or her managerial skills, but because they've endured or they're friends with somebody. And you can't leave because financially you're doomed. Um, what, what do you do to thrive and survive so that you still remain viable until something magical happens? Damned if I know. I mean, I, I, you know, that's a tough job. That's a tough situation. You know, I, I, try everything, you know, try everything you can to enrich what you're doing or maybe make it okay for you to get in, you know, involved in stuff outside. As long as, you know, to the extent that you can get away with it. You know, or if, you're, if the demands are that you have to be in your office doing stuff that make, makes you Q3 or Q4. Because if you're Q3 too long, you're going to go Q4. You like the language? It's easy to, they don't have to explain it to you, huh? So, I mean, I, I don't, that's maybe not a very good answer to your question, but that's a tough problem. And I'm sure, probably, especially a lot of women encounter. There's, there's a thing, there's, I can't remember the uh, article, or there's a course an AM, uh, that you can take with ISME or something like that, of, that, uh, of the problem of, uh, bias in diagnosis for medical professionals and so forth that it seemed like, and I can't, don't hold me on this, but the more senior and more experienced physicians are more prone to bias early, to, of, of uh, not looking totally at all the, uh, the test results and that kind of stuff and can lead to malpractice, that was an insurance thing, can lead to malpractice problems. So in other words, a physician in Q3 he has to be alert. Thank so. you so much, yeah. Charles. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. It.